Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to the uh, Natural Resources Seminar today. Uh, Mike Schwartz is here today with us uh, from the U.S. Forest Service's Rocky Mountain Research Station in Missoula, Montana. And uh, there he is the team leader for the Conservation Genetics Program, where they conduct genetic research for wildlife management issues uh, for the Forest Service. Uh, Mike is also adjunct professor at the University of Montana, and he was the acting um, past acting director of the Aldo Leopold Wildlife Research Unit, uh, Research Institute. Um, he received his bachelor's at Colby in Maine, um, his master's at American University, and in 2001, his PhD at the University of Montana in Missoula. Uh, Mike's research stretches an interesting uh, variety of fields from wildlife genetics to landscape ecology to even uh, economics modeling. So he works also with an enviable array of animals, including uh, wolverines and fisher and wolves uh, but today, and also apparently leopard seals from uh, the ancient past. But uh, today he's here to talk to us about cougars and their western expansion in the US. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I've had a great visit so far, and I, I really appreciate the hospitality and the interactions I've had thus far. So, when most conservation biologists get up to speak, well, well frankly, it's actually been quite depressing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, most of my talks have you grabbing for the, the bottle of whiskey or the you know, handful of Prozac or something just to get through the end of the talk. But today, I'm real fortunate to be able to present some uh, story about a recovering uh, carnivore population that's recovering not only in the west but in the east as well. And it's a talk that I call Cougars Expand East from a Contemporary Western Refugium Implications for Connectivity Model Validation. And the first third of the talk, first actually probably first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some recent mountain lion findings and I'll exchange use mountain lion, cougar, puma interchangeably. Um, I'll talk about some recent work that was done in our lab, some recent forensic work, and you know, those are actually a couple of really fun stories uh, that would be fun to present. The second part of the talk is the part that, that I've been thinking a lot about, which is what do these results mean when we put them into a broader picture, a broader picture of connectivity and about connectivity model validation. And lastly, if we have time, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think this means for some of our work. We spent a lot of time with my colleagues and my grad students and I, we spent a lot of time thinking about large scale connectivity and doing uh, landscape genetics to evaluate that connectivity. Okay, the cougar. So it's got the greatest range of any terrestrial mammal in western, the western hemisphere. It's one of those, you know, Wikipedia facts. I'm sure there's probably some shrew somewhere that might, might beat that or something, but uh, that's what it's been known for. You find it actually in every, every book on, online talks about that. It used to be a really widespread animal throughout, throughout um, pre-1900. So all through South America, North America, Eastern North America, there are thought to be populations of lions. It's been found in a lot of, it's a real general, it's found in every major habitat type in the US. And you can see that, you look at a picture like this, which looks like it comes from the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so, you know, real, real dry forested habitat to open slope habitat, all the way down to South America, into the continental, where you find it in kind of swampy habitats. So it's a, it's a real generalist. By the 1900s, it had been extricated in most parts of the eastern U.S. So that includes here in, in New York, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, some of the last populations. Um, but they were largely extricated by the 1900s, except for a small population in Florida has its own history. We get we spend many seminars on that population alone. And just to show you, this is a paper uh, from Roman Beek, who worked in our lab for a little while. Um, came out in science in 2006, but not. he was doing some virology work. Um, just really what I want you to focus on is this part, showing just to show you that decline. Here's, um, here's Montana, so one of the last places that lines um, well, one place that lines had a real strong, strong hold until about 1900s, and then you can see these are bounties paid. There was a strong decline in bounties paid. There's nothing in terms of all, virtually no bounties were paid here. And then when we look at, um, when we look at, at 
non-hunting mortalities. This is like animal control on road mortalities. <laughs> That's this faint line here. We see a big increase starting sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. And this coincides with a hunting season on lions that occurs in Montana. Now you could argue that this is an effort or an incentive-based uh, graph and that it doesn't mean much, but actually when uh, when Roman went back and looked at, at the viral DNA and then plotted some skyline plots of affected population sizes of the virus, he actually sees this increase as well, this, this recent increase. So it stays at a low level and then goes up and then actually there's been a, a slight tail as of late. So that's just the general, I, I want to show you this to show you the general trend of what's been going on even in Western populations. Fortunately for the lion, recovery is possible because natural recovery is possible because they are real capable of long distance migration. Um, there's some records of people having radio collars on lions that are traveling a thousand kilometers. Um, these are generally, there's a bunch of them in the four to three to four hundred range, three to four kilometer range. Those are generally sub-adult males, not surprising given mammalian life history strategies. Okay, this is from a, a, a NGO, the Cougar Network. They, they keep track of all sightings of, of lions. Basically, it's thought that, well, in 2008, when I pulled this, this figure, basically it's thought that the lions are doing really well out here. There's a couple of populations here we'll talk about, and then there's lots of these, what they call, you know, possibles and probable sightings. Uh, but, but still really low, very um, scant evidence that these things are, are actually lions. It's a, you know, somebody calls up because they've seen one, they, uh, somebody thinks they found a, a footprint in the snow or in, on the dirt. But generally what you see here is you have the western populations that are, that are you know, all throughout the west, and then we have these little island populations. And what's interesting is these island populations, that I mentioned that, that they were lions recovered in Montana sometime in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. Well, in the 80s, they were recolonizing North Dakota, 1990s they were recolonizing South Dakota, and even in the late 90s, early 2000s, there's been this population in the panhandle of Nebraska. And we've been working with this group here, uh, with the Fish and Game Agency there, to do some scat dog uh, detection, scat detection dog surveys to monitor the, the expanse and, and, um, and the health of that population. Actually, we're also working with South Dakota quite extensively to look at uh, how their hunting seasons are impacting the lion population. They just started putting some hunting pressure on the Black Hills population here. Okay, so you have all these other observations, and I can say that a lot of these samples, well, not a lot, I'm not necessarily sure they correspond to every dot here, but many samples that people, where people think they found a hair, a piece of uh, feces, or, or something that, that belonged to a mountain lion, they get sent to our lab through one mechanism or another. And we use various means that, to assess whether that, that hair or piece of feces is from a mountain lion. Sometimes we'll just do direct DNA sequencing. When that fails, we go back to the old tried and true restriction enzyme tests. This is just a test we designed, and it's actually it's in a publication put out in 2000. Uh, we just use a small region of uh, 16S RNA, RRNA, and you can see if you just look on this here, if you take and we can extract DNA from the cell, we just run a small PCR test, right away we can separate out the canines from the felids. When we soak, when we soak this uh, stretch DNA with one restriction enzyme, we actually can see a difference in banding patterns between the bobcats, so the bobcats fall out, but mountain lions and lynx look the same, then if we soak it in a different enzyme, we get the differentiation between lynx and mountain lions old technology, but it really works great with low, low, low qualities of uh, quantity and quality of DNA. So we've, we've actually uh, analyzed, we'll probably actually have the actual number, probably about 100 samples from throughout the range, eastern portion of the range, where somebody said they think they saw a mountain lion. A very high percentage of those turned out not to be mountain lion. And in fact, the distributions, it's uh, about 60% of them turned out to be some kind of a um, Either a wolf is all depends on where you are. A wolf, a fox, a wolf, a dog, or a coyote. Twenty-two percent or so turn out to be bobcats. Twelve percent lynx. Five percent fox, and we even get the one percent. <laughs> Those are often the fun to write the report back on that one. <laughs> now that doesn't mean the mountain lion wasn't there. It just means what was sent to our lab was not the mountain lion. Although, I can say in a couple of cases, you know, they send you the video that goes along with the, the piece of feces, and it's not a mountain lion. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about a few 
fun forensic case stories that illustrate the dispersal abilities of these lions. And then we'll talk about the connectivity models. So case number one, one of my favorite case stories, starts with a drop of blood in a Milton, Wisconsin bar. Is anyone here from Milton, Wisconsin? Been in there? Know about it? Well, this is a great story. A farmer opens up the door one day, go to his barn, and out jumps a cat over his shoulder, and, kept, and goes and looks and sees the cat run away. He goes and he looks, and there's a drop of blood in the snow. And fortunately, the folks at the um, Wisconsin DNR, they were really amazing to work with. They got out to the barn, they collected the snow, they sent it to our lab, and, and we started working on it. And of course, you know, not surprising that when a big event like that happens, a mountain lion jumps over your shoulder in the barn, <laughs> it makes the news, at least it makes it into the Gazette Extra. <laughs> okay? Big cat spotted in Milton. Uh, Janesville, Wisconsin. Right? That's, uh, you guys know Janesville in the news lately? Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan. That's Paul Ryan's birthplace right there. <laughs> okay, so the first question really comes in. Does the Midwest need to start managing for wild cougars? Do we have a population there? Or do we need better pet laws? <laughs> and you think, who would have a lion as a pet? I mean, at least that's my first thought. Well, it turns out, I know from some work we're doing in Missouri right now, there's probably about somewhere between 50 to 100 captive mountain lions. Okay, people have, not in zoos, but you know, as their domestic pet. I can't explain it, don't ask me to explain it. Uh, if you know anything about lions, we've been around them, no, they don't probably make great pets. So what we do, what we do with the samples, the first thing we did is we, we wanted to just quickly assess. We know that a lot of the animals in the pet trade, or at least there's been some work that this suggests that a lot of the animals in the pet trade are not North American cats, they actually come from South America. And so we thought the first thing we'll do is just a real quick and dirty test. We'll look at, at this region of uh, mitochondrial DNA. It's consists of three different genes, 891 base pairs. And in North America, there's only one haplotype. And if you combine the three regions, there's 13 haplotypes in South America. They differ at, at one SNP at one base pair, at one base pair here. We thought we could run this test real quickly. One nice thing about mitochondrial DNA is there's probably about 20 times more mitochondrial DNA in the cell, or at least it's more accessible to us. And we're able to uh, able to even really low quality samples we're able to get um, get a lot of success on, on species identification. Here's just the distribution of those haplotypes that I was just mentioning. So here's all of North America being one haplotype, except for I should say the Florida panther, the second, and then here are all the other haplotypes. And this, this has to do with the evolutionary history and probably post-glacial events that occurred, the probably contraction of lion populations out of North America and then a recent expansion, a recent colonization of North America. Um, the reason being, that, that's the reason why we only see one, at least that's the, the suggested reason why we only see one haplotype in North America. So um, that's this. This haplotype here, and it turns out that we end up with this haplotype, this haplotype M, which is common throughout North America when we ran it on our 891 base pair test. Okay, so it turns out it's a North American haplotype. Uh, we told, we reported that, we said this is, we, we can't say it's not, we can't say it's, it's not necessarily a, um, we can't say it's, it's a captive animal that was, or we can't say it's a South American animal. We start that over. We can rule out the fact it's a South American animal, but but it may have still be a, an animal that was in captivity because we, we don't we know that some animals that are in captivity come from North America, but the Gazette Extra uh, they grab and they say the cougar is likely wild. You know, quite an exaggeration from what we we're saying. We're trying to say that you know these are first tests ruled out. We didn't re you know we didn't report this. We, this is uh, goes through the, the DNR. So yeah, they they had a, kind of a gross exaggeration that. That it's likely wild, but I guess we need to get used to that from things coming out of Janesville. <laughs> um, anyway, couple, so we thought we were done with that. A couple days later, six miles north of downtown Chicago, we get this. Cop kills cougar probably in Chicago suburbs. Okay? My life isn't dull. On these, these things. So here's the neighborhood. Here's the coverage from Fox oh. News. I, this, uh, I like this. Uh, Fox News Chicago Cougar on tape as police officer searched for the animal yesterday. Hopefully that's not the police officer. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, the animal ended up this way. It's it read, if you read the reports, it's just like a, a mafia story. It was uh, 
it was escaping and shot six times in the back by a seven officer or something like that. <laughs> so, some horrific story. Uh, so they kill this animal. And so, of course, now we have this question. You know, are these animals the same individual? Is this the same animal that, that or is the Mid Midwest just lousy with cougars now? Uh, and if so, we want to know where did it come from? What's the source of all these, these animals? You know, if we do have a whole population now coming from, uh, from somewhere, where, what's generating that population? Well, being a geneticist, I have to show at least one obligatory gel in every talk, and this is it. I won't, won't bore you with details, but we use microsatellites. Uh, we have a panel of about 20 microsatellites that we use. Um, so there's one locus down here, a highly variable locus. Here's a very uninformative, non-variable locus. Um, and we're able to, through, through for those of you not familiar with microsatellites, you can, you can see quite readily that if you have each of these columns being an individual or an individual hair sample, you have enough of these, you develop a unique barcode, you can count, you can put a statistical probability behind it, what the probability of being of two of these individuals being random by chance alone. Okay? Now, some of you out there, some of you especially that are into genomics, and we do a lot of genomics in our lab, are probably saying, microsats, God, aren't these things old school? I don't want to hear this guy. You know, why are they using SNPs? Single nucleotide polymorphisms, that's where the whole molecular field is going to. We are using them. We're using them on some of our projects. This is a project. This is a trout project. Um, they are nowhere. They have nowhere near the power that we need right now for non-invasive samples. We may get there, but generally the machines that we're using for the, the when we have to run lots of samples, um, we're basically running machines that can look at 96 SNPs at a time. Okay, 96 SNPs. Uh, right now it's looking like a 20 to 1 ratio, somewhere between. 15 to 21 ratio in terms of power per, um, takes 20 SNPs to make up for one microsatellite, especially for a population like lions, where we have highly variable microsatellites. So, yes, we are being a little bit old school, but it, it really is the most important, it's the most appropriate tool for the stuff that we do right now. I just have to put that as a kind of legal disclaimer here. I will show you though, for something like hybridization, when we have, when we have something like cutthroat trout and rainbow trout, and then when we have this, you know, we have a, a, a hybrid in the middle, these things are working brilliantly. So they are useful, they just have to be used in the right way. You can't just grab the latest genomic tools at all times. Okay. Well, fortunately, because we've had so many samples come to us and we've been working with researchers around the West for such a long period of time, we have a DNA database that comprises of, comprised of 850 individuals genotyped at 20 microsatellite loci. Okay? This allows us to do quite a bit. It allows us to ask questions about what is the origin of these individuals and ask, it allows us to to put some probability of, of detection um, of having two samples and what, what the random chances of having them match by chance alone. So for the Chicago animal matching the Wisconsin sample, basically when we do an analysis, it looks like the probability of, of having those two genotypes matching by chance alone is about one in 87 million. So they were the same individual. Um, it wasn't that you had multiple individuals roaming, roaming around the Chicago, Wisconsin area. Okay, next thing we use is we just use an assignment test. This is one of the most simple tests that you can use. Um, basically what we're trying to, what we do is we take the genotypes from multiple different populations. We have an unknown individual. We assign that individual to each population. You know, what's the probability of coming from this population or this population? Clearly with my Halloween cat example, um, you can see that if you're doing this based on coat color alone, that would be a greater probability of coming from here. Um, so very simple test. The thing about this test is it assumes a, you have to make these a priori population assumptions. We did that. We have our populations uh, where we have strong samples from. We did have to do some grouping. And it turns out that the best assignment was from here, from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh, in fact, we had a 95.3% chance of coming from that population, about a, almost a 4% chance of coming from the Wisconsin population. Now, interestingly, if you ask a slightly different question, you run some simulations, you say, given the genotypes in this population, what's the probability that, that this genotype was generated? We actually get a much lower answer, something around 69, 70% chance of it coming from that population. So that suggests that we're probably not right on in terms of our sample. It might be, um, there's probably some bias in what we sample. We certainly have samples that are collected over multiple generations. That's probably driving that result. And we may have, we've sampled only one part of the Black Hills there's other parts of the Black Hills we haven't sampled, so it may be a, sub, a subpopulation of the subpopulation that we're missing. But in general, we felt pretty confident that, that 
this result suggests that the animal came from the nearest population, even if the nearest population was 900 miles away. Okay, Washington Post, they get the prize for the best title, Young Restless Cougars Rural East Working. Okay, just when I thought my life was calming down after that, and literally the phone goes off the hook, and being a, a federal scientist, you're not allowed to just pick up the phone and talk to the press. Um, there's many layers of bureaucracy that I'm sure some of you can appreciate. Um, I thought things were, we were done with cougars and our, our lion stories until June 11th, so almost a year ago, 2011, there was a cougar killed in Milford, Connecticut. Okay. Best line of this comes from uh, NPR, uh, Robert Siegel. Uh, I just pulled this off their, their website the other day. Mountain Lion was spotted in Greenwich, Connecticut, a super upscale bedroom suburb of New York City just across the state line. It's a place where you wouldn't be surprised to find a Jaguar of the XJ Super Sport <laughs> variety. But a real four legged mountain lion, you can read on and on. So, of course, and I need to be fair and balanced, right? I want to make sure I give you one side, but you can answer the other side, right? Fox Youth News, you know, although there's no population of lions in the Northeast, we believe that this animal would be likely a mountain lion that's been held in captivity and escaped. So, okay, we have this lion that shows up, of course, it makes a big splash showing up in, at the edge of the ocean. Um, well, what's interesting, what I found really interesting is the necropsy results. Necropsy results suggest that the show it's a young male, 140 pounds, it's not declawed. That's the first indication it probably is. I mean, you can imagine if this is if this sitting in your house, you're going to declaw it, right? <laughs> I know what my little cats do to our third drag, can't imagine. No tattoos, no collar marks, no pit tags, and interestingly, it had porcupine quills. So lions are known for being one of the, the few animals, lions and fisher, that, that will will take and, and actually hunt porcupines. Okay, this time when we started to look at this, we wanted to do a little better than just an assignment test. We actually wanted to look at uh, not make these a priori assumptions about genetic structure. Um, so here's where our here's the distribution of samples that we had acquired in our, uh, in our database, in our lab. And the first thing we did is we, we wanted to use the, the multi-locus genotype information to try to infer population structure. Okay, and then once we had that structure, we then turn and try to individually, probabilistically assign individuals to each of the subpopulations that were identified. And this is done, there's a lot of different ways to do this. We used uh, two or three different programs um, that, that accomplish this. The one I'm going to show you now is one called Structure. Um, it has its issues as well, but, and I have to say, this is a slide I stole from the author of the program Structure, to thank him, um, Jonathan Pritchard. Um, basically, you have individuals in a sample that have a mixture of, of unknown populations. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you know, through a series of simulations, assess, minimize Hardy-Weinberg disequilibrium and minimize uh, linkage disequilibrium. And so you can, and so you, you're, um, you're, you're basically running iterations until you find the answer that has, that has minimized the most linkage disequilibrium and minimize the Hardy-Weinberg disequilibrium. Okay, our results, Kind of, uh, people probably have seen a lot of um, those of you that do population genetics are probably used to seeing structure graphs. This is the likelihood of the different population of the number of groups from 0 to 16. Um, generally, it's been, you know, if you read this, people are saying you should be using the answer right when you hit an asymptote. In this case, it's k equals 6. It actually doesn't matter. We can look at our results for 6 groups, 7 groups, 8 groups, 5 groups, 4 groups. Our results actually turn out to be about the same. Um, there's also another measure called delta K, and in that case it suggests four populations. But it again, it's not going to matter. I'll show you the results for six, and I can show you later results for if we looked at other numbers of groups, um, because our assignment actually turned out to be quite strong to one of the groups that breaks out right away. If you look at this in a hierarchical sense. So here's what the structure results look like. For those of you that have seen red genetics papers, or you see these all the time. Um, those of you that aren't familiar, each of these bars is a proportion of an individual, so this is one individual and a proportion of its genome assigned to each group. So there's a green group, and that green group in general corresponds to North Dakota. Um, one of the fun things about this is actually when you go back to some of the, the field, you go work with field biologists, and you say, hey, what's up with this sample here? This one that you collected in North Dakota doesn't look like, um, doesn't look like it, anything around it. And they say, oh, yeah, this really, really good. often they have really cool stories. Yeah, we, were, uh, we thought we had everybody in this one home range, and then it turned out 
capture this new mail that came through in one year. You often hear those stories when you find these unusual plots. So this is what the, this is how you read the structure plots. Here is our South Dakota area. For the most part, we're seeing these individuals have this yellow grouping. Other individuals that were captured in South Dakota actually assigned quite nicely to some to the Montana populations. Okay, so here's our genetic samples. If we take those samples and we use a threshold, an assignment threshold of 0.7, so 70% of that bar being one color, we color code each of these dots corresponding to one of the Ks. So we have K equals six, and this is in the example I'm showing you. We end up with a map that looks like this. Okay, these colors are corresponding nicely to the colors of the previous slide, but we have a, a group that you clearly see is a North Dakota group, a South Dakota group. But this is a strange region of Montana. I'm not sure what's going on here. It looks like many individuals that probably recolonized from from um, both this Wyoming Colorado mix that seems to have two lineages. And I, I can't seem to find any uh, geographic feature or any environmental feature that sorts these two populations nicely. But we'll just start to work on that. And then there's a group that actually filled in samples in the last year. It looks like this whole region over here is just this one what we call the yellow group. Um, a real large panmectic area, which is not surprising given that I showed you that why it's moved so well. Okay? Um, Okay, we'll be revisiting this a little bit. Okay, so here's what all our 800 plus individuals look like when we mine, when we put this in with k equals six. And I should mention that when we do k equals one, or sorry, k equals one, everything's the same color, obviously. K equals two, we start to see. K equals two, we start to see this area in the southwest break out. When we get to K equals three, we start to see North Dakota. Uh, so, every, so it's everything, K equals two, it's everything, and then there's this group here. K equals three, it's this group, everything here, and North and South Dakota. K equals four, you start to see the split show up here. So you can look at this in a hierarchical analysis. I think that's the best way, believing that, that we've actually identified that there are K equals six, that there are six different subgroups is probably the wrong way to look at these analyses. At least when you get graphs that, that have that, that curve. We can talk more about that later. I have some pretty strong opinions of, on how to use this, these programs and how not to use them. Um, okay, so here's our, our database, our examples in our Rocky Mountain Research Station database, K equals six results. If we look at this bottom here, it's just it's a group of random samples um, that have been sent to us that don't really associate with the population, we just put them at the end of the analysis. And when we look at this, we see this is our South Dakota individual, or sorry, our genetic individual, which matches the South Dakota group real nicely. Okay? So again, another individual that assigns real strongly, um, that 99% of it is gene types assigning strongly to the South Dakota population. Now we can do the same thing I did before. We can run an assignment test and call up the exact probabilities. And actually, they are upwards of 99% assignment to a population if you have to force an assignment. And actually, I can't remember, I think it's 86% chance if you say, given the genotypes in South America, what's the probability, I'm sorry, South Dakota, what's the probability of generating this genotype here? Okay, so like from the Black Hills, we thought that was the end of that story, but it wasn't. We actually have another, had another database at the time we were putting, uh, trying to merge a few different databases, and it turned out this guy was already in our database. This animal that was in Connecticut was actually an already an animal that we had detected once before. And we detected this in a time period between 2009 and, and 2010, December 2009 to June 2010. Throughout Wisconsin, throughout this area of Wisconsin, there must have been a dozen, well, here are the sightings um, throughout Wisconsin. This, stuff, this comes from the Wisconsin DNR website. Again, the biologists out there do a tremendous job. Uh, really impressive state agency to work with. Um, they were getting pictures on trail cameras. They were getting uh, tracks in the snow. They were getting <laughs> scat and hair, and they sent all that stuff. You know, any of the, the things that we get DNA out of, they sent to us. And it turns out that when you look at, at all the all of these sightings that we get scat and hair out of, we actually look like we had the exact same individual over and over again. So this guy was running around Wisconsin. Wisconsin thinks that they have a population. There's no one that thought with all of this activity that this is just one individual. But in fact, all we have four matches from Wisconsin and then one match from Connecticut of the same individual, okay? 
and we have pretty good probability that, it, that this wasn't just some genotyping issue. Um, okay, if you look at this, again, another one I stole from Wisconsin DNR, you know, we have what with the South Dakota population, that's part of the breeding population, and there's good reason for that. We, we believe that this population is actually filling up its habitat quite nicely. I mean, in fact, they've started the hunting season because there, there's basically the black hills are, are filled at this point. There's no empty niches. So these young males are probably being forced out of their territories. Um, why they're going east and not west, I'm not sure. But um, they had this last confirmed probable sighting. Let's see, first confirmed sighting here, last sighting here. So this goes from uh, 1209 to 5, 2010, and then June 2011 here. You know, so probably we think it probably came up through here. Probably came right through New York and down into Connecticut. Okay, that's the picture of the last probable sighting. Not not one you want to see. Right? That's not a good habitat. <laughs> okay, New York Times picks that one up. Wow, Cougar traveled east 1,500 miles. Test fine. They did a little better than the Jamesville extra. <laughs> okay, so th those are kind of newsy stories. They're fun to look at, but we've been really interested in our group. And I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so um, just talking about some of the work that we've done on connectivity and connectivity modeling, and then relate this back to, to mountain lions. We spent a lot of time in our research group thinking about landscape genetics. So how can we use genetic data to evaluate how genes flow through a landscape? What landscape features are, are hindering the movement of genes and obviously the movement of individuals and which ones facilitate that movement? And we've done some work, uh, some, a lot of work on Wolverine. I'll go back and forth with some Wolverine examples here um, where we, you know, we've been able to show that, that Wolverine are moving through an ecological feature. It, it facilitates movement and we're doing this through looking at the genes, that much more so than straight line distance. And actually, we've looked at other landscape features, forests, and, other, and lots of other features. And it looks like, again, it's the spring snow that, that really facilitates their movement. We've, we've done this, um, we've published a few papers on this that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, one we put out in American Naturalist and just kind of talked about the general framework in 2006. Another one we put out in Ecology, talking about this specific example. And then recently we just have one coming out, I think it actually comes out this week, on um, well, one in conservation biology, here's the second one that comes out this week, talking about ways to turn this into some corridor maps. Okay, so we think a lot about how we can use genes to, to evaluate long distance movement and landscape genetic models. Um, and the reason we think a lot about that is the West, where I live, is a really changing place. We went from this, this is really common, Throughout the West, you get Forest Service block and then a private timber company block. You, know, you get this real this patchwork. Um, it's, it's really common to see this kind of a, a landscape. And usually, I mean, we either have large intact blocks or we have this. Um, and this is a legacy of, well, it's a legacy of Lincoln and the railroads and this whole, whole story behind this. But we're seeing this kind of transformation, or even if, if land was in private timber hands, it was largely intact. We're seeing it turn from that to things like this, where there, a lot of the private timber companies are not logging anymore. They're turning to real estate trusts. <coughs> and the first thing they're doing is selling it off, putting subdivisions in. You see this also in the inner mountain parts. Um, in between the mountain ranges, when we have these agricultural valleys, we're seeing, as we see in a lot of the West, we see this. And this neighboring block of land being this. Okay? So this is Missoula, Montana. <coughs> uh, one block in Missoula, Montana. You know, for, and so, we're seeing this rapid change. So we're, we're, there's a lot of recognition that if we don't do something right now, we're not going to be uh, putting aside some of the, the critical lands for connectivity now. We're going to lose our, our own chance. <coughs> and people have, have said, OK, there's been a lot of scientists that have gone out and, uh, and said, let's try to evaluate this at a broad scale. What kind of connectivity do we need across the US? If now is the time to be, to be buying and purchasing land. Um, you know, can we come up with this? This is the uh, wild lifelines. Um, from the Wildlands Network. This is their thoughts of, of major routes of connectivity. Um, and these things are getting a lot of traction. These maps and maps like these, in both at, at the national level and then even at the state level. So here, Washington State. Um, this is actually a state effort that is looking at, I, think, I can't remember the number of species. There. Montana's looking at 26 species. I think Washington State's looking at a similar number. And they're asking, how for each of these species can we maintain connectivity? So here's a badger. We're going to run these models. We're going to run connectivity models 
at the state scale, so the last one was a national scale, here's a state scale, and we're going to start to make both economic and energy decisions. So we're going to allow oil routes, we're going to allow um, energy development based on the aggregation of all this connectivity work. There's a lot of things that scare me about this. Um, and I'll show you, here's, here's a, a real, so it's going from the national level all the way down, I'll show you the local level here. Here's sage grass, this is Montana. This is a, a large chunk of Montana. Missoula, Montana is here. This is about over 100 miles, 150, actually about 200 miles away from right down here. So that, that's that kind of, I didn't put a scale bar on here, I should have. But one of the things that scares me about these connectivity maps is that anyone can produce them. This is a part of a project of a, a PhD student of mine working on sage grass landscape genetics. And I asked him, hey, can you just like, if you just take sage as good habitat and non-sage as bad habitat, what would connectivity look like for these populations that we're looking at? Because they're, uh, we're interested in these populations because there's a, a new energy corridor, a mountain intertie uh, energy corridor that's being proposed through this area. And he came back to me, not a year later, not six months later, not a month later, but he came back to me about an hour and a half later and said, look at this connectivity map I made for you. This is the answer for sage grouse. It's like, well, this is, I mean, it, it able to produce this in an hour and a half. You know, what, how do we, how do we judge something like this? How do we judge something like this? And this is a big issue because it's being judged, it's being taken, um, Western Governors Association, so the 17 Western Governors are saying, hey, I want to see these maps. We're going to use these as templates for how to develop the West. And it's going to be based off of all this connectivity work, okay? And this is, this is actually quite frightening, um, frightening to me at least. So let me tie this into to what we ger we're generally thinking about this. One, it's a little frightening that, that we're using some of this work without validation. And I think if you guys have fallen asleep and want, to, and want the, the, the take home message I'll give it to you now, I'll give it to you at the end, we're gonna need validation for a lot of these models. How we do it is really up for debate. And I wanna show you to bring it back to mountain lions, why I think this is even more important than I thought before. So it turns out that a few years back, someone did the exact same thing that we did with Wolverine. Well, at least some of the work, some of the things we did with Wolverine. Some of the things that's being done by the Western governors and wildlife lines, some of the things being done by the state of Washington, state of Montana, some of the things done by my grad student in an hour and a half. These guys didn't do it in an hour and a half. It's, it's actually an extensive modeling effort. They said, well, okay, how would cougars disperse they, they knew they had these sightings. How would they disperse from which population would they disperse and what would be their roots? So they went out and they did, they did a survey and they used this uh, analytical hierarchy process. It's an expert opinion approach where they say, um, you know, what do cougars need for land cover? What do they need for, you know, how much do they need to avoid human density? How about distance to paved roads, slope, distance to water? And they parameterized all this by surveying Every number of, a fairly large number of folks were surveyed. Um, they built some of these models. Actually, it's not even just that. They're asking the question not just like, do they need land cover, but how about each of these types of cover? So you go out there, you survey um, a large number of experts, and then put this all into a model and ask, okay, given if we, if we put a resistance on some of these things like housing development, so we put a resistance here, we can ask the question, how would lions move through the, the landscape to colonize the east? It's a really nice question. The question is, how good is this data to evaluate that? Okay? And that's the kind of least cost path modeling approach that we've been taking with some of our genetics work, just that we're using genetics and these guys are using expert opinion here. And so if we look at these paths and we do some fancy GIS work or we fade one and turn it into PowerPoint, um, <laughs> this is more or less what we get. Okay, so we have our map here, our genetics work here. We have their opinions of, of how lines should move. I'll separate them again. Um, I think it's easier to see that way. But we can see, okay, here's Missouri. Here's Missouri. The suggestion from, from this paper in the least cost path modeling based on expert opinion is that this individual here should have come from Texas and this guy here should have should have come from Colorado. What is our genetic data showing us here? It says this one here comes from South Dakota, this one here comes from South Dakota. Okay, so it's, it's 0 for 2 when we start validating this model, which is actually being used for regional and local planning. Okay, this individual here, 
This says it should have come from Texas. The least cost path, the quarter it should have used was from Texas. Well, where did it come from? It looks like it came from this population that we can't discern between Colorado and Wyoming. How about up here? Well, clearly this must have come from, from North Dakota. Well, that's not what we're finding with our genetic data. Our genetic data suggests it's actually coming from Colorado, the Colorado Wyoming population. Okay? And how about here? Same thing. The suggestion, these guys suggest that these individuals here should have mostly come from this population in Wyoming, but in fact we're actually seeing it coming from the Black Hills. So we're over many here. Uh, at least over 10, um, kind of all those dots. Where they did get it right was this population here, and they said this should have come from the Black Hills, and in fact, our data suggests it did come from the Black Hills. Right? I think this is a good illustration that we need to have some way to validate these models. We need to have genetic data, telemetry data, other data to validate these models. Okay? I just want to take the last take probably five minutes here, and then open it up for some questions about some of our Wolverine research. And how we're starting to think about our Wolverine research and our next steps and um, some of the things that we're concerned about as we start to, to do more and more of this connectivity modeling. All right, so here's one of the things we did with our Wolverine data after we, we kind of had a, an understanding that spring snow was on a, a, and I won't go into the details here, we can talk about it later, but we came up with this understanding that spring snow facilitated movement of Wolverines. All right, so this is Montana, Idaho, Yellowstone here, down in Wyoming. And we then said, okay, if we put scattered individuals, electronic Wolverine throughout the landscape and have them find each other through that least cost path, what would be the, uh, when we, and we aggregate all those least cost paths, where are the corridors? And this is this shape right here of what this corridor map looks like. Um, so what scares me about it is we put that out, we do this least cost path modeling exercise, it's based on genetic data, we put that out in the state, immediately we had requests for this. We had a state of Montana that went out there and said, hey, can we use this? We want to, we're about to purchase this land. We're considering this block of land and another block of land. We're interested in Wolverine conservation. Um, we want your map to help us justify the purchase of this piece of land. They went out a year, a year later and said, boy, well, is this piece of land here? And the, the, I didn't have the, um, the shape plot for it, but in this piece right here, does that fall on your Wolverine corridor? So it's not like we're doing this as just gathering dust. People are actually going out there, taking these data, and, and using them for large land purchases. So the question is, at what level do we need to, are we morally obliged to actually go out there and invalidate these models? Um, and, you know, I think this is one of those cases, right? Officer, my GPS told me to turn here. Clearly there's a problem in verification or validation with your GPS model. Um, same thing with what we're doing in a lot of cases. Um, I'm not going to go into how we do, what we do with the genetic tests. Um, but I can say that we're starting to think about how we're going to validate a lot of our genetic. So I should say one nice thing that, that we're doing is we're not using expert opinion. I, I don't think the expert opinion models are going to work very well, especially for a generalist like Elias. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do is at least we're able to build our models based on some understandings derived from population genetics and landscape genetics. And when I take that, that those least cost path corridors and I disaggregate what, what we made up corridors. So here's the Missoula, Montana, here's the Bitterroot Valley and all this, this mountain chain. Um, and I look at these corridors, and then we look at some of our telemetry data from some work we did. You know, same thing, here's Missoula, Montana, here's one Wolverine. So we actually went from up here, 55 miles away, back up in, in like, well, it's four days down and five days back up. Um, but you know, they are using something that looks similar to this. Now, is this a proof of, you know, does this say, you know, this, does it say that you, we got our landscape genetic models correct? No, not at all. It says we have an N of one that suggests we got it right. If this was 20 individuals, or if we had this over a course of multiple years for many individuals, I'd feel more confident. But this is where we need to go. We need to start then designing our studies, our telemetry studies, that can validate some of our, our suggestions from either expert opinion or, or um, our genetic data. We had another case I just want to quickly show you. We predicted in our, our Wolverine model movement from Yellowstone down into Colorado. We said, if they were going to recolonize Colorado, what path would they take? And we made a prediction in this paper. It turned out the next year, so there, no individual, there are no Wolverine, there were no Wolverine in Colorado. The next year, one with a radio collar just happened to go down in Colorado. And actually, we kind of got it wrong. We missed this little bend right here. But we largely got the story right on how that colonization would occur. So 
these are the kind of things. We need to start building up cases like this and designing studies. Wolverine aren't going to be the animal to, do, to design studies on. Um, the population the dispersal events would be too rare. But with any of these species, like when Washington's using 26 species or Montana's using 26, 25, 26 species, we need to start, um, it's I think it's really important for us to start validating these models. Okay, I'm going to end this and, and, and take some questions from you guys, but I want to sum this up, sum up the findings. One, cougars are expanding east. The refuge is one that seems to be South Dakota, and it makes sense. The population has come up uh, real rapidly in the, in, since the 1990s, and it seems to be, um, well, at least it has been one that's been, been the engine of the expansion into the east. Now, we're going to see. South Dakota has a very heavy hunting season that they just put on this year. I think, uh, I think multiple hundreds of individuals, at least 100 individuals, um, are going to be taken this year. We'll see over the next few years if we still see these dispersals coming from South Dakota or if changes in the hunting uh, population, hunting regulations, influence uh, the crop yield pressure. The second thing and probably the most important lesson is that it turns out there's something like 35 different states building these connectivity models. Um, expert opinion is not going to work. I mean, a lot of, some of them are based off of some old telemetry data, you know, some good solid biology, but the expert opinion models I, I don't have much confidence in. So I think when we start using that, we really need to go to that next step. We need to be doing validation. Um, because if you can't give somebody a map and expect them to have confidence in that map, especially when you're talking about land purchases, um, land swaps, or changing the management status of that land, unless you've gone and done the next step and validated, uh, validated those expert opinions. So that's a cougar story. And, and there's a lot of folks that I need to thank, both in the lab and in the field. Um, you know, just some of the folks that, that got us actually got us field. A lot of the field samples we got were actually from some other efforts we had, um, and some of these are some of my some of these are my grad students, some of these are my kids. But um, <laughs> so, and I guess with that, I'll I'll take any questions. <laughs> I see a question in the back. <laughs> So my basic question would be why assume that cougars use corridors? And let me give a little bit of background why I think that. So I've done work with dispersal of aquatic organisms across terrestrial landscapes. In this case, humans are the vector of movement. We use gravity models. So there are no corridors. I look at your map. I, I spent most of my life in Wisconsin. And I look at that map. I lived in Green Bay for 17 years. And I try to figure out how a cougar is going to get from Oconto or wherever on the north side of Green Bay to Connecticut and they had to cross two bridges or at least one bridge or go through the Rust Belt cities that I drive on I-80 to get here. There's no way you're ever going to, so they're not following habitat corridors. So why not just use empirical data? I'm going to go back to the gravity model example. Why not just use the empirical data, assume that they're dispersing widely across the landscape that includes suburban Chicago and built in Wisconsin? So I think that's a really good point. Um, First of all, we, they could have crossed rivers in the winter, right? Some of those rivers will freeze in the winter, and that seems to be when they got across. I'd like, some, I'd like to see that. I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I'd, yeah, I would see it. Um, but I think your point is well taken. The point is, just because we have some cool mathematical tools that can do least cost path modeling, that's not necessarily the best tool to be using, right? And, but I guess the perspective I come from is it is so prevalent. Right now we're doing a review of uh, all the states and what they're using for modeling exercises to build corridors. Like I said, I think it's upwards of 35 different states. That's not including regional efforts, and it's not including local efforts. And local efforts are, are you know, astounding, um, how many efforts go on to evaluate connectivity. Uh, where, where can we put an overpass? Where, where can we uh, widen the highway? Okay, so this is prevalent. And given that, what we find over and over and over again is the number one tool that gets used is either least cost distance, least cost path, um, or circuit scale, and that's just a, you know electron flow, electron flow model. But they're all they're all trying to make these assumptions that, that things are going to be really restricted through narrow corridors, and, and that that hasn't been as much of a concern for me, given that generally the species I'm working with are things like wolverine that probably do have pinch points and and do have some restrictions on habitat. But in some cases, like this lion, the lion example. Um, it, it might not be the case. There may not be those, those narrow areas. And in fact, if you notice what I didn't do, we have all this genetic data. We haven't gone out there yet and built our own least cost corridors. We do this, you know, I've done it for 
we built these cost orders with genetic data validating it for species, everything from mountain beavers up to through sage grouse, through blackback woodpeckers, all the way, you know, we've done it. I haven't done it here. One, there's a lot of reasons. I do want to do it. But I also, I think one of the layers we're going to need is a social layer because it is going to be a tolerance layer. I mean, what, why has this expansion of corridors, I mean, carnivores occurred? Largely, it's a social phenomenon. So I agree with you. It's a, there is a little bit of an abuse of a tool here, and I guess all we're saying is we need to stop abusing that tool. It's so widespread, and we need to start validating it. And there's probably grad students in here that could do a huge service to state agencies by saying, hey, there's connect I don't need to develop my own connectivity models. There's a dozen of them out there. I need to go try to validate these and show cases where it works, more importantly than where it doesn't, because we, we want to try to move forward. In your answer, just given you used the phrase social model, which I don't understand, could you explain it a little bit? So, um, or social economic model. One of the, so one of the things we've done with our Wolverine data, I showed you this paper that we put together. I, I, actually, I should even scare you more about this Wolverine paper. We, not only do we take our paper and say, here are the corridors, and put it out there, which you know, right there, and see how it gets used, already has a little frame. We then subsequently went out the next year, and, and or two years, sorry, it took so those two years, we did a whole bunch of climate change modeling and showed how spring snow is going to change. And then we projected corridors and looked at, at which corridors would be stable and which ones aren't. Um, so, you know, we're talking, you already have, we talk about error propagation starts getting pretty wide. But we've gone beyond that recently in the last, I should say, and, and um, peripherally involved in this next effort where we are actually adding things like housing density. Um, things like housing density, projected future landscape change. That's going to be important, but I think it goes beyond that. And I don't know how to do this. We can do that. We can have these projections and build out models. Right? We're, uh, Carla's still here. We're working with her group to, to add economic data and to add uh, some of this data. But what, what I can't figure out how to add, what I haven't been able to add, is how do you deal with attitudes, right? I mean, Western Montana, it's, again, i gotta, I got to bring this back. I can't speak to New York. I don't know what the, what the attitudes are in different places. Western Montana, the attitude is going to be of heavy, high tolerance, in, in some of the some of the non-ranching communities, lower tolerance in the ranching communities, yeah, the Eastern Montana, it's going to be shot. I mean, there's no tolerance. There's got to be a way to parameterize that for movement, um, especially as it, uh, especially as probability detection colludes with that. That there's probably some interaction. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the landscape connectivity too. Uh, First of all, let me uh, say that I agree that expert opinion is probably not the way to go, and uh, it, it's not the way to parameterize the uh, landscape, because uh, it also depends on the weights you put on uh, different environmental variables. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think probably finding an association between genetic data and environmental data is probably the way to go, uh, the way to parameterize the landscape. And the answers will also depend on the environmental data you're, uh, you're using. Uh, so a lot of times in these papers you see uh, uh, they, there's some a, a priori information like about the environmental variables that you expect to influence the movement. So they use uh, uh, just a handful of uh, those variables instead of using multiple variables, even, even something where you don't uh, necessarily see a connection. So I think uh, the best way would probably be to like uh, at, at least at first, uh, without discrimination, use as many uh, variables as possible, including uh, human influence uh, on, on uh, uh, the environment. Um, but really, my question is, uh, in, uh, in terms of least cost distance, uh, I, I guess you mentioned uh, you guys have used circuitscape too. So that doesn't look at corridors so much. It, it uh, looks at basically, or, or finds multiple corridors, if you will. Uh, it it uh, looks at movement throughout the landscape. There's also a more biologically relevant intermediate, I guess. Uh, it's called randomized shortest path. Um, I was just wondering if you guys have uh, played around with well, let's forget about that last one, but with circuits, so, sure. circuitscape and seeing a big difference between that and least cost distance. Yeah, so let me take your first question. Um, the first question was about variables that you use. Yeah. And, it's, and it's actually even worse than that because there's variables that, are, even if we get the variable, knowing the scale at which to measure it is often complex. Exactly. 
And so we have a paper on Martin where we look at multiple scales for variables. Um, we've looked at, we have a, a suite of papers where we've tried to play around with some of these, these concepts to see what really is influencing our ultimate, ultimate answer for what's the right uh, landscape variables influencing gene flow with some mixed results. Um, I think oftentimes, well, and we, we are, we're computationally limited for sure. I mean, I'm just thinking that we had our first analysis to do with black bears was 110 different models that we ran, 110 different landscape hypotheses that we tested against our genetic data. Yeah. Yeah, it took us, at least for us, took a long time. We need better optimization routines. And I encourage anyone that wants to work on those, that's a really a good place. There's folks at the University of Montana that I'm working with that are like, trying different machine learning approaches. So I think we're moving as a field, we're getting better at this. Um, so I completely agree with you that using multiple variables is, is, is really important. Probably staying away from expert opinion, although there are times when that, that might be, I have no problem formulating every one of those hypotheses, 110, 150,000 hypotheses based on expert opinion, as long as you then turn around and test it with a matrix of genetic relatedness, okay? So you gotta start somewhere, and I think if you, as long as you say these are hypotheses, then you're fine. So that's the first question. Um, in terms of circuit scape, that's the most, one of the most popular ones. That's one my grad student hits a button, gets me an answer in an hour and a half. Um, and I've had lots of discussions with Brad and Craig, who's the, the, the author of circuit scape. I think it's a really neat program. The problem is it's doing something very different than least cost path. Yeah. Okay, it's identifying pinch points. It's identifying, and so and it's almost got some weird assumptions. I mean, it's assuming that animals are moving like electrons. You know, that they can only move a single file through a little area. You know, and it, that, that's going to be the restrictions. It's a, a very, it needs to be used in very restricted circumstances. So I like, actually what we're starting to do now is put the least cost path on, restrain our landscape to just the least cost path, or least cost distance, I should say, with some width to it, and then on top, after we do that, then run circuitscape through that area and see if we can at least identify pinch points within the least cost distances. Randomized shortest path is a really good intermediate to can use both the distance and the circuitscape. But the bottom line is, I feel better, so okay, I promise you I'll finish this okay. real quick. You can do least cost path, you can do least cost distance, you can do circuit scape, you can do um, some a gravity model, you can do, um, uh, what's the set that Carlos Carroll has a new centralized measure, some, any of these graphic approaches, right? They're all based on the same thing. You can, you can use all those, and then at the end you have a whole suite of connectivity models. You say, whichever one's lit up the most times, that's the place I'm gonna recommend. I mean, those are million dollar decisions, or do you then turn around and say, okay, this is now a hypothesis. We have a hypothesis, we've refined that hypothesis. Now we need a secondary source of data to really feel confident. And I think we're not even doing the first part, the testing of genetic models, nonetheless the second part, which is going out with a secondary data set. So that's that's kind of the message. That if I had any message to deliver, is go out there and validate this, especially because these are being used in millions slash, you know, half half billion dollar decisions. So Okay, um, we're out of time, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, let me just remind you that next week. Our seminar is not on Tuesday slot, but on the Monday, our first seminar of next week is Monday at 12.30 in E&EB. It's the um, Biology Without Borders.